That's good morning, UPPC. Good morning. What's up? What's up? This is the week after Easter. We're ready to, uh, to enter into kind of a short four-week kind of window of teaching that I'm really excited about. And uh, for those of you who were with us last week on Easter Sunday, what a great day to celebrate the, uh, the good news, not just of, of Christ's resurrection, but the recreation that God is about doing. We're going to talk about that this morning. And for the next four weeks, we're going we're gonna to have a conversation that we're just simply entitling Heart to Heart, Heart to Heart. If, uh, if I had the honor of, of having coffee with each one of you, what would it look like to talk heart to heart? And, and there are some things after 25 years of doing ministry and, and for over a decade of pastoral ministry, there's some things that, that we just long to, I long to impart to you that are pearls of wisdom. And things that we need in this time of our lives. And so the next four weeks, we're going to have four different conversations around these pearls, these gifts, and maybe shifts in perspective. Today we're going to talk about a small shift in perspective that can have a huge impact on how we love others. And it is a chronic issue in the church. Okay, Chronic issue in the church. I don't care how old you are, if you are young. If you're in your teenage years, if you're in your 80s or 90s, this is something that every single one of us has to get better at if we're to embody the love of Jesus, and it's this. What do you say, what do you do, and what do you definitely not say when someone in your life has just experienced something awful? What do you say, what do you not say, What do you do when someone in your life has just experienced something awful? Fact is, it's true for all of us, everyone in this room, is that there are going to be moments where you have a close friend, a family member, or you yourself are on the worst day, one of the worst days of your life. And if you're in the middle of that, you want to receive comfort. If you're outside of that worst day, a friend or a family or a spouse, a family member or a spouse, You want to offer comfort, but you don't know what to do or say. Now, in this room, there are a few people who have years gathered up in their lives. And just a few. I see you. I see the shine off of your head, right? For those of us that have that, right? You live enough years. Live enough years, you have great days. You have the best days. Live enough years, you're also... Someone, you're going to experience it. You're going to have the worst days. And sometimes really awful days. So what do you say? What do you say at a memorial with your coworker who's just lost someone? What do you say in the face of a friend who just lost a child? What do you say at the announcement of a terminal disease for someone you care about? In any of these situations, you're at a loss for words. What do I say? How do I respond? And worse yet, when we're not prepared or we don't have these pearls of wisdom uh, in our tool bag, so to speak, we stutter around and then we resort to say things that often, if not uh, uh, regularly, betray the heart and character of God and his love. And they end up doing more harm than good. Anyone who's experienced death or loss actually could tell stories of the words they received from well-intended people that hurt them rather than helped them. So my hope is today is that this will be one of these days where we will be painstakingly practical, and I pray that it will serve us well as a church as we try to embody something last week, which was, if you remember, Revelation 22, that the, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, and that we could actually be healers. That in this in-between time between creation and recreation where we've experienced decreation, we can start to see glimpses of heaven in how we treat each other. And we can offer the leaves of healing to those around us. But it takes wisdom. And sometimes it takes just an awareness of what not to do. So we're going to have a painstakingly practical conversation. This is the day. Of first service, some people say, I wish you'd mentioned this earlier in, this, in, the, in the sermon, but this is the day where I just encourage you, grab your pen in front of you and write on your Bible or in your notes because you're going to want to keep some of this stuff. This is stuff I've collected over many years of pastoral ministry, okay? And this is my promise, okay? I'm just going to make a promise. If you focus in for the next few minutes, uh, you will benefit the rest of your life. You'll be more comfortable in those awkward moments, and your witness to Jesus will bring healing to those around you. 
Deal? Okay. Deal. Proverbs 12, verse 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Let me say that again. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. When someone is in shock and they've just received the worst news of their lives or they've just witnessed or experienced something that's just terrible, they're grieving and it's like an open wound and they're vulnerable and this image is vivid. Reckless or thoughtless words, they stab like knives, like swords, the proverb tells us. We may be trying to help but can often be unintentionally hurtful. No doubt well-meaning, but these words, these sayings, these trite axioms often come across as reckless. And so they stab like knives. And worse yet, some popular sayings uh, thrown at people recklessly can paint a picture of God that is outright cruel. Outright cruel. So this is what I'm going to do today. I want to tell a story of, of an experience where I used reckless words. And I hurt someone. I want to talk about what words we're not going to use anymore. We're going to eliminate from our vocabulary here at UPC. And then we're going to talk about words to say. How do we do this? And, and all, in all of this, I'm going to have a little bit of a, of, a, of a helpful image for us. No, we're not playing darts. Some of you want, want to play darts. No, we're going to have an image here that will help you. And, uh, and we'll uh, give you some, some uh, kind of a, a perspective on how to use your words in the future. Okay? First, an example of when I got it wrong. Uh, I'm not proud to tell you this story, and I don't want you to think I'm perfect in this area because all of us have at one point or another, we have used words that were reckless. And we didn't even know we were hurting someone sometimes. The first church I ever worked at was First Presbyterian Church in Yakima uh, in the central part of the state. Judy Kelly was a longtime member of our church. She prayed for me when I was a kid, and she would always want to take me out to lunch and, and know what was going on in my high school years and then uh, and then in my college years, she was a little bit older. She was a saint of the church. And I had gotten the awful news that she would have diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And if you don't know pancreatic cancer, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's not the diagnosis you ever want. And so I went to visit her in, at her room in the hospital and was not prepared for what I was about to see. She was a shell of herself. She was emaciated, and if you've ever seen someone jaundiced because of, of pancreatic or liver cancer, um, it was so awful to see that my stomach was churning. I was sick. And her husband was there, Bill, who I had known for years too. He was faithfully by her side, watching helplessly as she declined and was suffering. And she was close to death. After a brief visit, and we prayed together, and I held her hand, we went out to the hallway, and I thoughtlessly blurted out to Bill, oh, man, I wasn't prepared to see her like this. I don't know if I can handle this. Now, we're going to talk about, in just a moment, why that is, was a terribly unemotionally intelligent statement to say to, of all people, Bill, her husband. Okay? But it was interpreted by him, and it was true of me, of my intent, which is that this is really, I was communicating, this is really hard for me. For me. And his face, when he heard this statement, immediately changed. You know that moment where you wish you like, had like a, like a little wheel that you could wheel your words back in? Anybody like that? No? Okay, some of you not so much. You're perfect. Yeah. No, but some, most of us, right, we get this, it's, I just want, I didn't want to blurt those out, and I wasn't prepared to see her like this, and so I let it out of my, what I was thinking out of my mouth, and and it was reckless. And I was operating out of my own comfort, not his. And the look on his face said it all. I meant, I really meant well to be there. But my observation and my, my churning the table of his need and the crisis he was facing as the husband to Judy ended up being about me. And my observation hurt him, and it added to the heartache that he was feeling as he helplessly watched his wife die. So this is the thing. 
Today, I want to talk about how do we enter into those situations with spiritual wisdom and actually embody the love and healing of Jesus, that we can be the leaves, the foretaste of heaven in some of life's most difficult times, okay? And I'm going to give you a rubric in just a moment for what to say and who to say it to, okay? But before we get there, let's just, can we just, can we just use our Sharpie to strike some words from our vocabulary, okay? Yes? Yes? Okay, so we're, we're going to do some work on getting rid of stuff that we resort to so that we can pick up better things to say. The first one, and I'll begin with the big dog, it's possibly the worst thing to say in the face of death is this. God needed another angel. Okay. God needed another angel. Okay. I don't know, friends, I don't know how many times I have heard this statement after memorials or in the face of people who've lost children. In fact, I remember a young woman who lost her child to SID, sudden infant death syndrome, and someone said this to her, and her immediate, honest, and I think honest, it felt like justified. Her immediate response was, after someone had told her, God needed another angel, she said, then why didn't he take your kid? Why didn't he take your kid? Not only is this statement, God needed another angel, it's not... It's not only theologically and biblically wrong because people don't turn into angels. They never have. There's no, no instance in the Bible story where a human being all, sort of, all of a sudden morphs into an angel. Totally different created realms. Totally different purposes. We as, as human beings are actually made in the image of God. Angels serve the purposes of God. But the more damaging assumption from this comment is that God is somehow involved in taking children from their families. And then play that out. So God gives you children, but he's going to take them back if he feels lonely. What does that say about God? What does it say about your own pain? Would you want to draw near to a God if you honestly believed that God took your child because he was lonely? That doesn't work. And we talk about here at UPC all the time of bifurcating heaven and earth. Remember, even this last sermon series, we talk about how like, yes, God's presence is fully known in the throne room. That's temporary. Soon there will be a reunion, a union, a recreation of heaven and earth called a new Jerusalem, a new heaven and new earth, okay? That's what we read about in the last two weeks. But, but the problem with this is to, is to think that God is taking someone away to, to, to that place and leaving us alone. And so part of this is just to understand that God never meant for children to die and to communicate this sentiment to a parent in the midst of unimaginable loss is, is really to misunderstand the character of God. It may even turn them away from God in their moment of need. Okay? So, let me be clear. Grace abounds. Grace abounds. But if I ever hear a UPPC person say this at a memorial again, you will get my stink eye. Okay? It just doesn't. It does not help. Never heard someone say that helps. Okay? That's number one. Number two. It's for the best. It's for the best. And my simple response to this would be, for who? For who? Just like the previous statement, it attempts to bring comfort with a distortion or even a minimizing of loss and the grief that comes with it. I, I want to say to the person who says, how do you know, uh, you know, how do you know that? Uh, you know, uh, for who is this the best? Do you have some sort of insight that none of, else, of us have been given? Because it doesn't feel like the best. And it feels like this statement is often to minimize pain, to minimize someone's experience. My, uh, my dad uh, really uh, never recovered from watching my older brother die in 2001. My dad was a sh- very strong civic leader, was strong in, in our home and convictions, and he was a good, good man. But something in 2001 broke him. And that was watching my, my older brother pass away at too young of an age with a preschool son and a wife and just starting his adult life and because of a heart condition and a heart uh, virus uh, he died at a tragic young age and it broke my dad there was nothing that was for the best in that experience for my dad or our family it was just awful there was no best everyone that was left behind Might be good for my brother who was finally healed in the presence of Jesus, great. But for those of us who were left behind, it was just awful. To strike that from our phrase, we can use something better than that. It's not for the best, okay? Third one, ready? Ready? 
she's in a better place. Okay? Or he's in a better place. Again, when someone passes, this is often the, you know, the, the, uh, the sentiment. Now, Proverbs provides us with wisdom here. And there's actually a sentiment that we teach with our, our deacons and people who are in care ministry. Certainly any pastor who's gone through chaplaincy work with families. There's a proverb that speaks so well to this. Proverbs 25.20. And it says this. Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day, or like vinegar poured on soda, is one who sings songs to a what? To a heavy heart. One who sings songs to a heavy heart. In fact, there's a famous book that was written with this title. And uh, the fact is, we, if you've been here at UPC very long, we teach from the biblical story which tells us that we were, we were designed to live here on earth. Amen. Amen. We were designed to live here on earth. And our human bodies were created for existence here. And when heaven and earth join again in the future, we're going to be resurrected into what? Our bodies. Our presence with our loved ones, right? And our best place, the place we were created for, is right here. With our loved ones, with our family, with our community. This is, the, this is where we were meant to be. And what we mean by saying a better place is often just that someone's in the presence of God and no longer suffering. suffering. That's fine. But in biblical theology, heaven and earth will come back together and God is here in this place. God's already trying to break through into our world with his spirit's presence. And the underlying motive of this statement often is that it's a desire to fix someone's grief. You don't have to grieve. They're in a better place. God would even disagree with that. God would say, no, the best place, the best place I meant for you to be is to be with your loved ones, healed and whole, the way I created you to live in the beginning. And so let's not, let's not use this statement. Often statements like this, honestly, they just lead to more grief. And so be careful with this one. Don't say, uh, uh, by the way, don't add to this, like, you know, she's in a better place. You know, you should, you should hear what happened to me. Or here's what I would do if I were you. Fact is, is when someone is, is experiencing a center of grief and loss and trauma, no advice works unless they ask for it. You're tempted to give advice, don't, okay? So, number one, God needs another angel. Two, it's for the best. Three, she's in a better place. He's in a better place. Fourth, this is God's will. This is God's will. Gosh, I don't know how many, like, social media accounts where people will leave these, leave these comments. Uh, just throw away comments, but one like this, which is, this is God's will. The close cousin is, uh, by the way, in our second realm, is there's a reason for everything. There's a reason for everything. A good axiom is to never say something about God that you can't say to parents who've just lost a child. And so to say that this is God's will implies that God did this to someone. We can say God doesn't kill children, ever. God doesn't cause disease. God doesn't cause divorce. There isn't some rolling of the dice where God is, God's will is, imp, is, is, is imparting some sort of suffering and the rod of suffering upon your life. This is one of the misunderstandings of Job, by the way. Uh, is that sometimes, yes, li- life is very, very hard and difficult. Can God bring out good things out of hurt and wisdom and loss? Can we, can we, can we find wisdom in hurt and loss? Yes. But that is a very different thing than saying God has caused this to happen. So we make God the cosmic principle to which people have to go and receive their punishment because he's willed awful things. That is not true. Not true to the character of God. God is the healer. He is the redeemer. He is trying to heal this broken world that we live in and heal our wounds. So let's strike this is God's will from from our language. Deal? Okay. Number five. Oh, this is so hard. Number five. With time you will move on. Or time heals all wounds. It's kind of a secularized version of this. Again, well-meaning, and if you're in a close relational position that has experienced similar loss, this may seemingly be something you'd want to say that brings comfort, but often it discounts the very real feelings being felt in the present. Fact is, a lot of people have have pain and losses in their lives that they never really true truly have recovered from. I remember a story uh, and an experience in our, in our community. It was about 23 years ago, and it was the loss by a tragic car accident of a young man in our school. 
and this family just reeled. And, and the poor mother, I remember seeing her every time I was at the grocery store. And one of the things we'd learn in our chaplaincy was one of the best responses instead of, in time you will move on. No, it's that everybody else moves on, but you're stuck. Everybody else moves on, but the pain is still here. I still remember my child. I still remember the loss. And I remember this with this woman. was One of the chaplains that I was working with, Tom Craighead at the time, said, said something that was so wise to me. He goes, you know one of the greatest gifts you can give someone? Instead of saying, time will, will move you on and you will forget about your child. Instead is to say, I remember your child. And every time I saw her in the grocery store, it was usually a couple times a year, I, just would, I would always just say, Mary, I remember your son. He was a good boy. And she would just light up because someone re- remembers. Because she hasn't forgotten. She didn't forget. And so the time moving on, it, does it change? Yes. Yes. But not helpful to someone when they're in the midst of experiencing hard things. Okay? So let's strike with time. You will move on. Deal? All right, number six. Oh, this is a tough one, and we're going to just get rid of this one altogether, okay? God won't give you more than you can handle, okay? By the way, all of these uh, people think that they're, they're spiritual truisms. Not a single one of these things is found in Scripture, okay? God won't give you more than you can handle. I was with a family, not here in our congregation. It was a, it was a friend from college, but it was a while back, and they had, they had lost their 30-year-old son to suicide, and a friend of their family that was present for the memorial came up, and I was present, I listened to this, it was a member of a church herself. She was a good-meaning, well-meaning Christian. But she said these words. She said, God won't give you more than you can handle. I believe you'll be able to get through this. And the father responded back, honestly and earnestly, he just said, how do you know that? How do you know that? Because at the time, it was more than he could handle. It was more than that family could, could handle. They, they were dying. It was awful. And it was a reckless thing that she had read on a bumper sticker somewhere that she thought could bring healing, but instead it just drove the knife deeper into the wound. And friends, everything that I know about God, there are two things that are absolutely clear. One, God does not give tragedy to people. And there's certainly, like, there's a conversation around why God has allowed certain suffering to exist in the world and the brokenness of the world and how we all are swept up into that. That's a, a conversation about theodicy. But ultimately, we have to always remember is that all theology is healthy theology if it points back to the goodness of God and the beauty of God. And the brokenness of our world is, is what's responsible for the losses and suffering we experience. It isn't God standing on some proverbial throne dishing out suffering. That's not how God works. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is, is loss and grief often are things we can't handle. We can't handle it. We don't have the capacity for it. We try to cope and, and we can't do it, at least not alone. Which is why we need community and support and healing words when those times come. And therapists and counselors and friends and loved ones to gather near us because we can't do it. In fact, I will venture to say this, and I believe this to be true. I'd love if any counselor or therapist in the room wants to talk to me about this the thing, but the part of the awful nature of the crisis of mental health in our day is because people think, they think to themselves, well, if I was normal, if I was good, well, then I could handle this depression, but I can't. And so it forces people into ever-increasing loneliness around their mental health because you can't talk to anyone because you should, of course, according to the world's wisdom, you should be able to handle this. But the very nature of anxiety and depression is you can't. You literally cannot handle it. You need help. Which is why we need community and support and honesty and the invitation to say, when you can't handle it, I'm going to be there for you. When you feel like you're at your last you know, straw, your wits end, I'm going to step in and be a good friend or a good spouse or a good neighbor. Okay? We need healing words when those times come, and they will come to all of us. Okay? So we're going to strike. God won't give you more than you can handle. Deal? Okay. All right, number seven. We're almost done here. Let me get you in the corner. Number seven, I know exactly how you feel. Okay? 
And at, this, is, this is really common, and I think it's common because we enter into situations, again, we're well-meaning. We're like, someone has just experienced a divorce or a diagnosis of can- bre- a common one, for instance, breast cancer in our community. It's just, it just is awful. It ravages women in our larger community. And oftentimes you can approach and go, I went through breast cancer. I know exactly how that feels right now. Problem is, you don't. You really don't. You have an experience that echoes what that person has experienced, but you don't know how they feel. The fact is the situation that they're in may be entirely different. When someone loses a spouse, when they go through a divorce or a diagnosis, they have their own unique feelings and experiences. Fact is, someone lost, lost their wife, right? It's not the same as when I lost my wife. It's not the same as when I lost my husband, okay? Fact is, your situation may be similar on the surface, but the relationship is so different. Our pain and loss is different. So No, you can't say, that's how I feel. That's why I think a better response is just, I can't imagine what you're going through. This is often, uh, by the way, I know exactly how you feel. It's often what is said before advice is given. And again, advice is never helpful unless it's specifically asked for. Seven things. Seven things to strike from our vocabulary. Got it? Okay. But then you say, Aaron, but then, then what do I say? What do I say? Well, we have our own feelings. We have our own process of grief to navigate, okay? Our own feelings of angst as we observe what others are experiencing. Now, let me just be, I'm going to be completely honest with you about some of the brokenness in the world. I want to get everybody's eyes if I can, okay? One of the dysfunctions of our secular world, and especially within the West, is that we despise grief. We are so disturbed by it that we want to stay away from people's awful days and experiences. We're so addicted to comfort that we often don't even want to pursue people or come near to them when they're going through the awful. Okay? This, is, this is a terrible facet of, of suffering and of tragedy. One of the most common ones we teach in divorce recovery is that when you go through a divorce, everybody runs. No one wants to come close to you is that in our culture, we don't like to draw near. In fact, most people think the most caring thing to do is to say nothing and give someone space, right? That is not Christian. That is not Jesus. It was never, we don't have any commandments to say, when someone suffers, you know, loss and trauma and, and, and suffering, then give them space, right? The Beatitudes say quite the opposite, it's actually to draw near. In a couple weeks, we're going to talk about erring on the side of, of presence as Christians when we believe we're part of the healing of God's work in uh, others. Okay? But we, we have to draw near. And there, there is always opportunity for us to play a part in the healing of other people's experiences. But how do we do that? How do we do that and not resort to what I did to Bill and to Judy when I walked into the room and made that about me, okay? I'm going to give you a rubric here, okay? A woman named Susan Silk developed something that is really, really helpful. We teach this in in, uh, care work, but it's called, I'll call it right here if you can see on the screen, it's called the ring of comfort, okay? The ring of comfort, okay? Now, in this rubric, don't judge my handwriting. I know, it's terrible, okay? I have serious in- insecurities. So. But you're going to see my giftedness in drawing here in just a moment. But the ring of comfort works in just about every single arena of life, okay? Where people have experienced some sort of loss of a job, loss of a loved one, a diagnosis, divorce, whatever is uh, uh, something where they're aggrieved and they're afflicted, okay? And the way this works is that you draw a circle in the middle of a piece of paper and napkin, okay? And it's a simple method for making sure that you don't pierce people with words uh, and, and you instead you use words or you direct your energy towards healing. And it works for all sorts of crises and it goes like this. You draw a circle at the middle, okay, right here. And then you place the person that's at the center of the, the crisis in the middle. They are the center of the crisis, okay? They're the ones that are going through the worst of it, okay? I'll tell you, okay, I'm going to say something. I don't want, where am I on screen? Here we go, here we go, we're good. Uh, <clears throat> I remember when my, my son, Peter, uh, who's just a courageous kid, our whole family was courageous around 
uh, him battling cancer. But I remember one time someone asked me, like, so how's Peter really doing? And I go, you know, I just don't want to talk about it right now. And she goes, she's his response, no joke, was, you know, Aaron, his cancer is not just about you. And my response was, oh, really? Was it about someone else? Because our family is hunkering down right now. Like, it's time, to, it's go time. We're in battle mode. Like, but, but their thought was that maybe they were at the center of the circle. Well, oftentimes we can kind of exchange ourselves. The fact is, is the person at the center of that crisis was Peter. The, the person at the center of the crisis that I talked about earlier at the hospital was Judy. Judy, she's the one that's dying She's the center of the ring. She deserves all the comfort, okay? Now, this is, this is how it works. You put that person in the center of the ring, and if someone has cancer, that's them. If someone's going through divorce, that's them. If someone's had a diagnosis, that's them. If they've had a job loss, you name it. But like in this instance, Judy is in the center. Now, you draw a larger circle around that person, and the next ring is the person that's closest to them, okay? In this case, it was Bill, so I'm going to write spouse, okay? And then the next circle children. In some cases, parents, right? Parents. Okay? Then you have family, and then friends, and so on and so on. Then you have loose friends, the larger community, right? You're preeded as much as you need, but you pee people in concentric circles uh, in the, the closest person to the farthest out person. Parents and children before distant relatives, Intimate friends in smaller circles, less intimate friends in larger ones, right? You get the idea, right? Yep. Do you? <laughs> okay. But when, you, when you're done, you have the order, and then you have this, you know, this, this outer circle community, okay? This, this order, okay? And the way Silk describes it is that the rule is this. The person in the center of the ring can say and do whatever they want. That's the one privilege, I suppose, of being at the center of the ring when you're, when you're going through your worst days. That's the one privilege. You can say what, do whatever you want, anywhere. Okay? Judy could complain. She could moan. She could grieve. She could weep. She could ask for what she wanted because she's the one who's suffering most. Right? She's the one who's suffering most. Everyone else can say things too, but this is the key. This is the key. They can only say it to circles outside themselves. So the rule of thumb is comfort goes in to those who are in the inner circles, okay? And your needs go out. You dump your needs and your emotions out. Got it? Okay. So in this case, was it appropriate for me as a friend in this circle to tell Bill as the spouse how this was impacting me? No. It was reckless. You know who I needed to go talk to? My parents. My pastor. My friends. Because they can offer me comfort because I was farther in the circle. Okay? But this happens all the time. So many people are inclined to go to the person in the middle, middle of the circle and say, I'm just really struggling with, with how your, how your uh, cancer diagnosis has hit me. And they're asking for comfort from the very person who needs comfort, okay? This is, this is the comfort and dump out phenomenon. And when you're talking to a person in a smaller ring than yours, closer to the crisis, the goal is to, is to help them and serve them. And if words are necessary, that they are there to heal, which we'll talk about in just a second, okay? But listening is more helpful, more helpful than anything else. But if you're going to open your mouth, ask yourself this. Something I wish I could have told myself when I was in that hospital hallway. Was, are the words, is what I am saying for their benefit or mine? Is it to comfort me or to comfort them? Okay? And if it is, then don't say anything. Don't say anything. Because your words will oftentimes do harm. It will pierce like a sword. And so many people, when they're in this part of life's journey, they feel alone. They feel alone. And they feel helpless. And they need comfort. They do not need to comfort people in outside circles. Got it? Okay. Their comfort in, your comfort out. Friends, if we could get this right in the church today, 
and, and get these words out of our vocabulary and instead uh, uh, offer comfort, we could do so much good because terrible, reckless words, they are like spiritual paper cuts. And ultimately, we, we want to encourage anyone in the middle of the crisis or in close circles, we want them to know that the Lord is with them and that God hasn't forsaken them and they are not alone. Okay? They are not alone. i got to wrap this up. I'm going long. Okay, here we go. That, that is the deal. If, if I could wrap this up, is uh, you, can, you can express your own needs, your own feelings, how shocked you are or how sad you feel or whine about how it reminds you of the terrible things that have happened to you lately. It's fine. It's a perfect norm, per- perfectly normal response. Just do it with someone in a larger ring. Got it? A larger ring. That's the emotional intelligence of care in the spirit of Christ. Okay? Instead, uh, of uh, saying words or reckless words to individuals, I want to give some suggestions, four suggestions, but is to just help you know and keep in mind that no magical thing you can say to make a grieving person feel better is going to work. No- nothing uh, will, will take away what they're experiencing. But uh, if you are going to say things, there are some things that I will just tell you are so important. And anyone in this room has experienced their worst day, a loss, uh, especially of a loved one, they will agree with this, okay? And also, it, some people don't like to talk. But a couple weeks now, we're going to talk about how your presence speaks, okay? Uh, first is this. Um, the first statement I always just think is so important and so helpful, and there's someone in this church that writes me a, a note like every other week just saying these words. But it's just simply the words, I love you. You are so loved. I love you. Notice that that statement is not conditional, it's not trying to fix, it's just stating a fact of, I love you, I see you, I love you. Second thing, I'm so sorry that this has happened, okay, I'm so sorry this has happened. Fact is, 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 uh, that's what we're experiencing in grief, is just that we have sadness, we're sorry. We don't, we don't love that this has happened for anyone in our lives, I'm so sorry this has happened. Third one, I think this is crucial. Crucial. Say, you are not alone. You're not alone. Sometimes the best way to say you're not alone is to show up at someone's house, don't knock on their door, don't do anything, mow their lawn. Drop off a casserole, say, put it in the freezer if you don't like it. If you don't like it, throw it out. I don't want the dish back. Just know, you're not alone. I'm here. We got it. We'll talk about this a couple weeks, but one of the things we got to strike from is the, one of the things you, you don't say is if you need anything, let me know. Okay. Nobody ever has ever taken me up on that, by the way. No one. Because we so don't want to be put out, right? Is instead just do it. Do what you think would be a blessing. Don't go something crazy or over the top, but, but even just flowers on, on, on a doorstep to say, I'm here and uh, I am, uh, I'm grieved with you. I'm so sad, sad this has happened and you are not alone. You are not alone. And uh, then there's nothing. To say nothing but to, just to let your presence speak. One of the most powerful ways that we experienced that in our lives was uh, early on, um, when we were quite a bit younger, uh, our, we were trying to get pregnant. We had a miscarriage. It was it just, Miscarriages are always terrible. That's a, that's a dark day for anyone. And uh, I remember our neighbor, Judy Davis, and... And she was a lovely person, but she overheard some conversation by family that was coming into the house. And she was so grieved that she uh, was led to do something. She didn't ask, can I do something for you? She just did it. And she made a a plate of warm brownies and a gallon of ice cream and put them on our front step with a note of, I love you guys. That's it. Didn't, Didn't do anything else. But that night, those brownies and ice cream were like a communion meal. It was like the bread and the cup. It was like spiritual in terms of just being seen and a beautiful way that that she showed up and embodied love to us. Friends, the fact is of those four statements, Jesus embodied it all. And we want to be like Jesus to others. Let's let's start doing things more intelligently when we encounter these things in our lives and with others. And I think we'll be part of the healing leaves of the nation. Deal? Deal. Let's pray. Let's pray. God, may it be so in us that we could just be people who, who are a balm, who are the leaves of healing for those who are experiencing loss. And would you, 
Uh, help us to not only have wisdom in those moments, to know when to speak and to speak the right words, but also how do we uh, receive those words when we are in need. God, we look forward to recreation when we no longer have to have conversations like this. Would you continually guide us to be more pastoral in our love for others, our neighbors, our friends, and ultimately that we would embody the love of Jesus Christ and how we approach anyone who's going through loss. May it be so in this room as we've just picked up a bit of the wisdom tool set in our tool bag and we put that into play in our own lives, we ask. And all God's people said,